Uh, it's my great pleasure to have uh, my friend and colleague uh, uh, Merdat here from Surrey University. He's, um, he's a full-time research associate yet now, if I understand right, with Rahim Tafazuli in Surrey University. We have been uh, going through good times and tough times with the Bifemto project, but it's going pretty well. And he's a... Um, He's essentially, uh, you know, his background is exactly what he's going to be talking about, the cross-layer scheduling. Well, I think there's an element of energy as well in there, so we'll see what, what you will have to present today. So the floor is all yours. Okay, can you hear me now? Okay, much better. So uh, I think uh, this presentation, maybe it was better if we had this presentation before the very nice presentation by Professor Barbara Rosa, because this, in this presentation, I'm gonna, it's going to be like a prequel, so I'm going to talk more about the uh, basics and fundamentals of, uh, uh, I can say, resource allocation, and uh, uh, we're going to talk more about the um, uh, optimization tools and what we can do to do the resource allocation, in particular for the case of femtocells. So, uh, in this talk, uh, um, I'm going to start uh, to talk about the cross layer operations. What is the cross layer operation? Uh, why we need that and how it is done? And then we're going to um, focus on a a specific subcategory of uh, cross-layer uh, optimization called uh, air interface centric scheduling. Then we will gonna see that where femtocell is gonna stand in this picture, and then uh, we will talk about this scheduling as an optimization problem, and we also talk about the different notions and representation of uh, optimization, and we also talk about fairness and. Uh, other uh, issues, and finally, we talk about some specific challenges, and uh, um, at the end, I'm going to uh, conclude the day with concluding remarks. So um, first, I want to talk a, a little bit about cross-layer operation. Some people may be mm, familiar with the notion, some may be not. So I mean, the three important questions are, what is cross-layer operation, why we need them, and how we do them? So I think before we start to talk about what is cross-layer operation, I like to start with why we need cross-layer operation. So basically, um, if we consider the uh, internet revolution in the past decade, um, this has revolutionized what uh, we see as the traffic architecture. I mean, now in, for the traffic architecture has evolved towards uh, data communication rather than uh, I mean traditional uh, voice-based systems, and this requires managing the packets that uh, are around in the network, and uh, it, it essentially defines new elements in the system. First of all, to differentiate, uh, I mean, the uh, services at the packet level, and at the same time to uh, be able to give priority to uh, uh, different entities in the network to access the resources of network. So in case of wired communication is more straightforward. This can happen by the, the definition of the quality of service at the packet level as well as by introducing the packet scheduler across the um, different parts of the network. Um, if we consider the problem in case of wireless network, um, I think it is more challenging because wireless spectrum is a scarce resource, as we know, and achieving high spectral efficiency is quite crucial for wireless networks. At the same time, wireless spectrum is lossy, and it is more prone to, I mean, other losses like interference. And um, the many protocols right now that we have got in the, uh, actually, on, in, in the internet, for example, like TCP, they have been originally designed for the wired systems. 
So uh, these protocols are not fully optimized for wireless systems, although the new variants are coming up and coming up, but still it is uh, uh, not something um, heterogeneous at across all the network. So uh, if we uh, want to consider the packet scheduling in this type of systems, uh, two uh, issues are getting important. One is uh, thinking about the channel status of the uh, different users, or in other words, the channel profiles that we have got. And the other is the traffic requirements in terms of fairness or quality of service requirements of uh, different users in the system. So if we consider all this and put it together, so we need a richer uh, uh, interlayer coupling in the system to, uh, I mean, support all these multi-objectives together and to be able to optimize our link and the total system together. So uh, considering this, um, I mean, preliminary introduction, now if you want to talk about the, what is the um, cross-layer uh, um, optimization, cross-layer optimization in general refers to any violation of layered architecture to adapt to the dynamics of the uh, wireless system, considering uh, service demand and channel, pro channel profiles uh, and um, issues related to them. So this cross-layer operation can be defined between uh, different layers across the network, as you can see here in the picture. So what are the general trends in this cross-layer operation? In general, three major areas can be identified in this aspect uh, that uh, uh, we have categorized them based on uh, user-centric, root-centric and air-interface-centric. In the user-centric case, I mean, the, uh, the most important factor is adaptation of, uh, I mean, uh, important internet protocols to wireless channel to, um, in majority of cases, to achieve a certain end-to-end -end, uh, figure of merit, like end-to-end -end throughput or delay. And this is more focused on the um, upper layer of the protocol stack, like TCP. And here, we have more abstraction for the channel modeling. So basically, less con consideration is given to model all the contributing factors to the channel in majority of proposals. In the root-centric case, uh, we try to incorporate the information that comes from um, uh, different layers to find the optimal route across the network. So this uh, type of uh, uh, cross-layer operation activities, they try to couple the network layer with physical, in particular with physical and MAC layer to, uh, I mean, uh, enhance the uh, route selection process across the network. And the third, and the main focus of our talk is going to be about the air, air interface-centric uh, cross-layer operation, where we are more focused on the efficient utilization of resources. And uh, for the efficiency here, we have got different measures, including the system throughput, fairness, and quality of service. So now we're going to focus more on this air interface-centric scheduling to see what is there uh, in history and literature based on interface-centric scheduling. So basically, um, if we want to talk about the scheduling, we should talk about the evolution that we had from the traditional concept to the current view that we have. In the traditional systems, um, we used to consider dedicated channels for different users across the system. For example, this was... Uh, uh, um, uh, actually valid for the cases like GSM systems. And uh, in that uh, period of time, we had the dominancy of voice traffic. And this uh, uh, system could be, um, I mean, sufficient for that period. But by moving, as I said, because of the evolution that we had in the um, data communication and moving towards more packet-centric systems, the in the current view that we have, we have a notion of shared channel, which has also been introduced in uh, the new variants of, uh, for example, uh, uh, UMTS systems like HSPA and then 
uh, from that point onwards to LT and LT advanced systems. So we have got this uh, notion of shared channel when uh, we um, face this elasticity of the traffic, for example, for the case of internet, which gives us uh, the uh, privilege to prioritize our packets in the network based on the channel quality. And this will provide us this uh, multi-user diversity gain. So in this new concept or current view that we have got this shared channel, scheduling and radio resource allocation plays a, a crucial part. So to better have a picture about this radio resource management uh, dilemma, I can say, uh, here I try to just talk about an analogic model, uh, which we call it customer provider mod model. In this analogic model, the mobile users that we've got across the networks can be seen as the consumers of goods, whereas the network operators are more similar to the providers of goods. So here we have got uh, some, um, I can say, some contrast or some difference between the objectives of, of these two elements. Uh, customers, they are more uh, into bargain and quality goods, while providers are more interested in the net profit. So if we consider this generic picture here, where we're going to map that our resource allocation problem to this customer provider model, what the first thing that we can see is the non-uniform distribution of cost across the systems. Of course, it is easier for a provider to provide goods at the local stores uh, or at the places that are closer to the uh, provider's stores. And this is basically due to less transportation costs that we're going to have. However, in practice, customers are not just uh, I mean, distributed in the local stores. The customers are distributed in the entire area of network. So uh, if uh, the providers, they just want to simply focus on nearby areas, this will lead to losing far off customers. So on the other hand, the far off customers, supporting the far off customers is quite expensive. So if we consider this generic picture, the provider's challenge would be to support good for different stores at appropriate time. And therefore, in this situation, the low cost seasons should be identified. So if we consider this picture, a scheduler would be the entity that is in charge of providing goods. And in different neighborhoods uh, in, in the area, which is the customer possible location, at the, as we mentioned, at the low transportation cost seasons, uh, which uh, reflects the better channel quality. There are other important factors that should be considered in this model. Uh, one is the balance in the provision of goods in different uh, areas, which is a notion of fairness. And the other is the minimum expectations that user might have in the system, which is the quality of service. And another factor would be the coupling or some sort of uh, uh, competition that's going to be between different stores that can be modeled in the form of interference. So as you can see in this generic picture, the ev eventual e efficiency of the system depends on multiple factors. So in this generic picture, where femtocells stand and what would be the position of femtocells in this generic picture? If you want to consider femtocells in this generic picture, femtocells would be like small shops that we're going to have in different neighborhoods. And of course, having these small shops would divide the transportation costs, and it would eventually provide us uh, better uh, opportunities to support uh, different customers. And at the same time, it will uh, help to increase the revenue for the providers in the system, because it will reduce the cost. And at the same time, it will uh, provide the opportunity to do better uh, reuse of the resources. So the question that comes up is, what would be the catch in this scenario if we have many of these small shops? Of course, one issue would be about the maintaining these many small shops, which uh, brings the scalability issue of the system. Another issue would be uh, we need to prevent cannibalization of the traditional stores that we, do, that we used to have, 
when we are introducing these small shops. And at the same time, we should be careful to manage the feisty competition that might happen among small shops. So based on this, uh, three solutions and three different aspects can be covered by uh, regarding the maintaining, we, we are moving toward uh, more self-automation and self-organization. And at the same time, it is important to have a better control on uh, interference in such scenario, uh, both cross-tier interference between femto and macro, and also co-tier interference, which is defined between femto cells. So these are major issues that should be considered in this picture of radio resource allocation. So considering this uh, model, now uh, we can see the uh, scheduling as an uh, optimization problem. So uh, generally, our objective is in this model, as we talked about it, if we want to see both customers and providers, uh, I mean, demands and expectations, we need to have a uh, overall system efficiency definition which it can be modeled as an objective function. And this objective function would be uh, subject to different constraints that comes into our uh, problem based on the required quality of service, uh, mm, mm, power requirement, interference requirement, and all different issues. So we, if we consider this model, uh, the, obje the objective function can have different representation. It might have a cost minimization representation, or it might be as a profit maximization. So distinctive factor that comes between different models comes from how this cost or profit is modeled. So now I'm going to talk about more about this optimization models. Uh, in general, if we consider the problem as the framework in the framework of cost minimization, the most important cost that comes to the mind is the power that we're going to consume in the system. This is somehow analogical to the transportation cost that we talked about. So in this context, uh, the problem can be defined as the minimization of total power in the system. Uh, it, in this formula, uh, N represents the total number of users in the system where PN symbolizes the required power of uh, user N. And this power comes from aggregation of the power that's going to be distributed over different resources in the system. Uh, and uh, as you can see here, the K n has been used to show the fraction of resources that are eventually going to be allocated to user n in this optimization problem. Of course, considering this optimization problem, some additional constraints involved in this optimization problem. The first important constraint that we have got, which is specifically in case of intracell, is the exclusivity constraint, which implies the fact that each resource in intracellular scale is going to be allocated to a, a single user. And this orthogonality uh, uh, brings uh, uh, some sort of simplification in the problem to of resource allocation in intracellular scale. And uh, if we consider that this means that if a resource has been allocated to one of the users in intracell scale, of course, another user in intracell uh, should not utilize the same resource. Besides this power, this constraint in intracell scale, we have got the, um, another constraint which is more related to the quality of service requirement or minimum rate constraint. So if we consider in this model, each user might have a minimum rate requirements. And this uh, rate requirements here essentially uh, tries to aggregate the uh, achievable throughput of users on different resources. And then uh, this uh, minimum rate requirements should, can be uh, theoretically different for different users in the system. Another concern that should be taken into account is the target interference. Uh, so we might need to guarantee a, quali a minimum uh, quality of service requirement for the primary users that we have got in the system, which are the macro users. So the thresholds might be defined for the upper bound of uh, interference that uh, can be used or can be, uh, can be allowed 
from the uh, secondary to the primary users. And at the same time, we might have similar uh, minimum service requirements for the femtocells as well to guarantee a minimum level of service for the femtocells. So here, these uh, values represent the femto to macro, macro to femto, or femto to femto interference. So if we consider this cost-based formulation, as you can see, this cost-based formulation tries to uh, find the optimal uh, resource user pairs in the system in a way that it minimizes the total uh, uh, power consumption. And at the same time, it tries to satisfy different requirements and constraints inside the system. And as it is obvious, this is an intercoupled problem between the resource allocation and uh, power allocation in the system. And uh, in generic form, and in the case that we consider the problem as a, a integer allocation of resources, this problem uh, can be computationally complex. Uh, later, we come back to the solutions on how to tackle these kinds of problems. So after talking about the cost minimization, another form of representation would be profit maximization. The uh, uh, rate can be considered as the simplest form of profit that we can consider in the system. In this context, uh, the problem can be formulated as maximizing the total rate in the system. And again, N here represents the total number of users. And again, Rn symbolizes the same potential aggregate rate of a user. And as you can see here, this uh, uh, eventual rate that the user is uh, getting depends upon the achievable rate on different resources. And this, is, uh, uh, this depends upon the transmission power as well as the channel quality that we have got on this specific channel between the user and the base station. So similar uh, constraints that we had in case of cost minimization, they are involved here, <coughs> including the exclusivity constraint at intracell and minimum rate constraint, as we talked about it, and also the target interference threshold constraint. Additionally, we have this total power constraint as uh, generally the base stations, they have got a limited uh, amount of power that is allocated to them. So basically, the, the total power that's consumed in each base station or femtocell uh, is going to be upper bounded by this uh, consumption value. Still in this framework, we see this interdependency between the two problem of resource uh, allocation and power allocation in the system. And in uh, this form, it can bring significant computational cost. Another form of profit maximization would be in terms of utility. Utility functions are quite uh, well known in the area of economics. Uh, the good thing about utility is utility can provide a strong coupling between the user level satisfaction and system level satisfaction as it can be a subjective or objective uh, indicator of user satisfaction. And normally, utility is highly correlated with the achievable uh, rate of a user on different resources. But this uh, also, a utility function can embed notions of fairness and quality of service inside itself. So uh, that's why it has more generic framework or representation compared to uh, um, other cases that we have mentioned to integrate everything inside one um, general objective. And uh, of course, these uh, formulations, as we talk about it later, are interchangeable and they can be transformed to each other based on the decomposition. So basically, as we see later, the shape of this utility is quite important factor in the, uh, determining the uh, fairness criteria or quality of service criteria in the resource allocation policy. So now that we have talked about uh, utility functions, uh, it is uh, good that we talk a bit about fairness because as, as I mentioned, in case of the utility functions, uh, 
Another issue that uh, arises is re regarding the fairness. And uh, it can embed fairness inside it. So what is the notion of fairness? In general, in literature, if we look, uh, the, uh, the term fairness conveys a different uh, notions across the literature. Sometimes it refers to the rate fairness between the different users. Some other times it is uh, based on the temporal or resource fairness. Uh, and uh, it can also uh, uh, be um, imposed in short term or in long term uh, perspective. So in case of, for example, if we consider rate fairness, rate fairness tries to uh, bring some sort of balance between the rates that are uh, allocated to the different users in the system. And uh, in this sense, it looks similar to the minimum uh, rate requirement or minimum quality of service requirement. But uh, rate fairness can provide a, a stricter constraint on the allocation process as it might not simply uh, be satisfied by mm, reaching that minimum rate or minimum quality of service threshold. And a strict fairness policies can <clears throat> even have some sort of conflict with the main objective function that we have got in the system. So we should always consider the fact that supporting the poor users as far as others always going to have a higher price compared to the uh, normal cases. So besides the rate fairness, we have got the resource fairness. When we talk about the resource fairness here, it is not important for us how the rates are allocated to different users, uh, but we try to have some sort of balance in the provision of resources between the users. And these resources might be defined in time domain in case of temporal fairness, or it might be defined in frequency or code domain. And uh, these are different notions of fairness. On the other hand, fairness can be imposed, as I mentioned, in short-term and long-term perspective. So considering the short-term fairness, uh, this fairness is going to uh, impose some constraints in a per slot manner or per snapshot manner. And this would be more uh, stringent on satisfi satisfying the fairness criteria. So mm, on the other hand, if we consider the long-term fairness, long-term fairness is more relaxed and it introduces a softer notion of uh, constraint on our system. And it can provide a more degree of freedom to utilize the resources. For example, here we have got an example to show that um, imagine we have, we have got a system uh, that we're going to monitor it in two slot time window. As you can see, if we want to apply the fairness criteria in the short term perspective, uh, in the first slot, we're going to allocate, for example, uh, uh, three uh, resources to each um, uh, user, and we're going to do the same thing in the second time slot. But as you can see, so this is a, a strict fairness criteria that we have applied. But as you can see in, for example, this scenario, as user two had a bad channel condition in one of the, one of the resources, anyway, it might not be able to fully utilize that resource, which has been shown in white. And similar case might happen for another user in, different, in another time slot. But if we wanted to apply similar fairness criteria in the time window of two slots together, as you can see, better utilization of resources was possible, whereas on average, we could have similar uh, fairness criteria in long-term perspective. So talking about this long-term fairness, uh, the notion of long-term utility comes up. So, so far we have talked about utility and profit maximization, but we have modeled this utility based on the instantaneous rate. However, in practical systems, in many cases, uh, you see that the, this utility actually has been defined based on the long-term uh, averaging value. And uh, for example, proportional fair which is one of the famous schedulers, uh, I mean, in the, which is also uh, used as for benchmarking in um, uh, LT, HSP, and other systems, is a more long-term 
utility function. And in this scenario, we try to define the utility optimization in a long-term perspective, and this is uh, achievable through defining this uh, real-time exponential averaging. As you can see, by using this real-time exponential averaging, still our utility is going to be a um, linear function of instantaneous rate that we have got. But uh, this will give us a notion of long-term fairness, which is tunable through this alpha value, which is proportional uh, to the, uh, which is inversely proportional to the time window that we have got for our scheduling problem. So now that we have talked about these different representations, in this part we are gonna more focus on the solutions to. Uh, different representations that we have talked about so far. So in general, uh, I can categorize the solutions in uh, three different ways that have been seen in the literature. And of course, there are more and other heuristic ways to do the, um, to solve this problem. But three uh, categories that I'm going to talk about it in this presentation are relaxation, splitting, and decomposition. Uh, regarding the relaxation, as you uh, as you've seen in this optimization problem, we have got a objective function and we have got some uh, additive constraints, and these constraints uh, put uh, impose uh, some requirements on our objective function. So, in case of relaxation, what happens is this pro uh, prohibitive constraints are initially relaxed, and the relaxed problem uh, uh, can, uh, in practice, is more, can be more feasible to solve. And by relaxing that constraint, we can have a more feasible solution. And after that, we have relaxed the constraint and find the solution, we can reapply that relaxed constraints on the uh, uh, outcome or intermediate solution that we have got in, the, in this stage. Of course, by uh, doing this approach, we might introduce uh, some suboptimality because uh, we are trying to initially solve a relaxed problem. But in many practical cases, the solution would be still near optimal. I'm going to talk about it uh, a bit more in the next slide. Another approach that uh, ha is in literature is based on the splitting. In case of a splitting, we try to split the problem into uh, simpler sub-problems, and then uh, these outcome problems are going to be um, solved in an um, iterative or one-shot manner together. So essentially, we might have a master and a slave problem, or we might have uh, equal problems that they uh, uh, interact with each other with uh, some message passing. The other uh, more systematical way of uh, solving these kinds of problems would be through decomposition theory. Uh, considering the decomposition theory, the constraints are integrated within the original problem, and uh, the problem uh, uh, is decomposed in dual domain problem. And then we try to solve the dual counterpart of the original problem. I'll talk about this uh, duality more in later slides. So regarding the relaxation, <clears throat> one important example that we have is um, regarding the exclusivity constraint. We have talked about the exclusivity constraint. As we mentioned, this constraint is usually applied in case of intracellular scheduling. So resources are not uh, practically shared between different users at intracellular scale. So this orthogonality of allocation uh, transforms the optimization problem to the domain of uh, combinatorial uh, domain. And in this case, uh, uh, finding the solution based on the exhaustive search can lead to a phenomenon called a combinatorial explosion, which uh, is uh, essentially uh, exponential growth of the complexity with the uh, growth of uh, different variables inside the problem. So this is something that we want to avoid. And therefore, uh, this exclusivity constraint can be uh, like a, mm, uh, is a, mm, a major tackle uh, besides our main uh, and original optimization problem. 
So one way that has been suggested in literature and has been introduced in many different frameworks is through time sharing. By using time sharing, we initially relax this uh, exclusivity constraint and we assume that users are allowed or are entitled to share uh, resources in time between each other and by doing so uh, the uh, allocation variables they are transformed from uh, integer programming and binary programming domain into uh, continuous domain and uh, Better methods that are uh, that are applicable to linear programming can be applied in this scenario, and uh, then the solutions to this problem can have a polynomial complexity, and which are more uh, feasible. And then after that, we have solved this relaxed problem based on the time sharing. Then uh, the relaxed constraints can be reimposed into our original problem and uh, to outcome time sharing based solutions for example by a hard mapping uh, to different uh, users in the system and in many practical cases al although this uh, notion might be suboptimal but near uh, optimal performance can be achieved in many practical scenarios that are applied in uh, resource allocation Another notion that uh, I talked about was a splitting. In case of uh, one uh, way of splitting that we can talk about is, for example, in case of uh, here, we consider a generic objective function, which tries to maximize the objective function over the vector of x, which is the, our um, optimization variables. And as you can see, we have got some uh, constraints beside the main problem which uh, uh, tries to impose a, a minimum threshold to uh, a function of our um, uh, optimization variables. Uh, in scenarios like this, one way that has been heuristically used in the li literature is they, it's try, we try to split the problem into double stages. In the first stage, we try to maximize the main objective function, ignoring the constraints that we have got uh, in this uh, problem. And at the next stage, we try to verify the validity of the constraints that we have violated. In case of the violation, we, in, for the resource allocation, we do some sort of reassignment. So basically, in this form of optimization, we initially go to the maximum achievable uh, optimum point for our uh, uh, relaxed unconstrained problem and then gradually we are moving down from that point uh, towards uh, uh, by applying the constraint in the system. Of course, by using such methods, it is really to uh, guarantee the near optimality and convergence, some conditions are quite crucial. First of all, we should uh, consider minimum cost when we do this reassignment. So when we do the reassignment, the reassignment should happen ideally to the users that impose the uh, minimal penalty to the system compared to the other users, which this brings us an intuitive uh, figure of merit to do our uh, radio resource allocation. And at the same time, the reassigned resources should be left out from the next iteration, otherwise, the problem is going uh, is not going to converge, and it may uh, show uh, some sort of uh, oscillations in the provision of the results. And uh, uh, the algorithm should stop as soon as we have satisfied all the violated constraints. In this manner, we make sure that we have minimum distance from the optimal point of the unconstrained problem, and by this we. Uh, somehow reassure the near optimality of the solution. Other more systematical uh, way that we should consider for the um, for such problems and resource allocations is through decomposition theory. And here, as you can see, again we have got a generic formulation where we want to minimize the our objective function over our optimization variable set 
And again, we have got some additional constraints besides the main objective. Uh, for example, this constraint can be the minimum rate constraint or whatever if we think back in the original framework that we have talked about. So to uh, use the Lagrangian duality property, initially we will relax all the constraints by using this uh, Lagrangian duality theory. Uh, so this is how we form the Lagrangian by introducing these new variables called Lagrangian multipliers, which are essentially the prices associated with each constraint. So by using this Lagrangian duality, we are introducing the constraints and the corresponding prices into a single uh, closed form, which is the Lagrangian of the original problem, as you can see here. And uh, this is somehow gives us the notion of dual objective, which is the dual objective uh, would be a function of this new uh, multipliers or uh, Lagrangian prices. So this new function or dual objective is defined as the minimum value of the Lagrangian uh, over the uh, primal, I can say, optimization variables. And as you can see, as uh, it's infimum over the original uh, uh, optimization variables, it would be a function of the dual uh, variables. So, so why, why we did this? Uh, I, I mean, what, what's the good thing about this dual objective and what uh, nice properties we can get from this dual objective? In general, if we consider the characteristic of the dual objective as it is defined as the infimum of the Lagrangian over the primal variables, so we have got uh, this uh, specific condition which holds for any feasible set of primary variables and uh, Lagrangian uh, values which are uh, essentially uh, greater than zero. So this specific property tells us that uh, the, uh, the we can get an, uh, a lower bound on the optimal value of our primal objective, which was f, by simply maximizing our dual objective over its uh, dual variable. So uh, the difference between the values of these two objectives, which is primal and uh, dual, at the optimal points, at the corresponding optimal points, is called the duality gap. So in general, uh, based on the first uh, characteristic that, that we talked about, this duality gap is going to be always a non-negative number, but it's not essentially zero. This is called weak duality in literature. So uh, in general, then, as we said, this gives us just a lower bound on the main objective that we have got. However, if we consider uh, the scenario where the our primal objective is a convex function under some mild condition, it, can, it has been proven that this duality gap reduces to zero at the optimal point. What we get from this is primal objective can be equivalently solved by dual at the optimal point because they both at a strong duality uh, give us the same value. So based on this, as we saw here, the important factor that gives us the capability uh, to use this uh, Lagrangian property and to use the, the dual decomposition theory is the convexity of the original objective that we have got here. So in this scenario, convexity is quite important. Uh, in general, we can say convexity is like the boundary between the easy and hard optimization. And because uh, it provides us this uh, strong duality condition, and uh, by using this duality condition, we can essentially integrate our original uh, problem and its constraints into the dual objective. And this will help a lot to decompose our problem and to uh, find feasible solutions for our problem. So basically, if we want to mathematically define the convexity, uh, a function like f is convex if for any sets of uh, uh, any variables like x and y, 
uh, in the F domain, all the linear combination of them would be in F domain, which essentially means that it, th this function has a convex uh, set as the domain. And at the same time, this condition should also hold uh, for uh, mathematically for a function to have a uh, convex uh, uh, formulation. So if a problem is convex, then we could uh, find the dual problem and we could solve our optimization problem through this dual. So the question is now that we have integrated these constraints into this uh, Lagrangian, uh, how we can uh, use this uh, formula to solve our problem? So here we try to use a gradient or subgradient method, which is a uh, efficient uh, updating method uh, to move gradually towards the optimal solution of this problem. As you can see, at, uh, this is the formulation that we have got. So in case that the function uh, that we have got, like g, is uh, uh, differentiable, at uh, the point uh, lambda, then we can use the gradient method. But in case it is not differentiable, we're going to use the subgradient instead of gradient in this formula. And as you can see here, we have got the iterative update of all different Lagrangian multipliers. The good factor about this gradient or subgradient method is this would decouple our uh, uh, different uh, optimal dual objective variables from each other, and it gives us the uh, possibility for uh, parallel updating at the, sa and at the same time to, do, uh, to have a distributed representation of these pricing variables. And uh, here, as you can see, we have got a, a step size, uh, which is a positive step size. And uh, this step size uh, is quite important in using this gradient or subgradient method. Two factors are important, actually, in using this uh, uh, form of updating. One is the initial point that we start to update our uh, uh, gradient or subgradient. And the other is the step size that we move like, uh, stage by stage towards our optimal solution. So generally, I mean, intuitively, this uh, step size should be chosen as a small value, but it can be chosen as a fixed value in case that we want to have a totally distributed implementation of our algorithm. But at the same time, we can use, uh, uh, for more centralized solutions, um, we can use diminishing step sizes as well, which means that essentially by uh, more and more iterations, our um, step uh, size gets smaller and smaller. But I mean, of course, it should follow some uh, specific patterns to uh, guarantee the convergence and optimality of final solutions. So the important issue here is uh, the, regarding the convergence to the optimal point and how fast we're going to converge uh, to this uh, optimal point. So, so far uh, that we have talked, uh, we, um, now we can uh, use this uh, convexity, because now we have talked about the convexity. So this convexity is quite important to see if we can use this framework to apply our problems. Um, so it's important to see if the problem is convex or not. If we consider the radio resource uh, allocation problem, for example, in case of femtocells, in low interference regime or in, in negligible interference cases, uh, the, this problem, the problem going to decompose across different cells in the system, and it has got the, this convexity characteristic. Therefore, uh, the resource allocation and the power allocation is going to be a per cell resource and power allocation. And power allocation, as already been discussed about it, is going to have a uh, water filling uh, format here. I've shown it based on the utility formulation. And as you can see, it's going to be utility-based water filling or multi-level water filling, which is dependent on the, uh, uh, also on the marginal utility or the derivative of utility at the optimal point. 
And the resource allocation, as you can see, based on this formulation, is going to have correlation, again, with the marginal utility and the achievable rate that we have got on different resources in the system. So basically, in this uh, case, we're going to have a, a two problems of power allocation and resource allocation. And then we, we are going to have some iterations between these two problems to find the optimal solutions. But eventually, as you can see, we have got a mathematical uh, closed form for both problems in case we are uh, working in low interference regime. Uh, but in case that the strong or medium interference presence in the system, uh, once the luxury of orthogonality is broken, uh, the radio resource allocation problem is not convex anymore. And uh, the, generally, we cannot say that this dual, uh, a strong duality holds, which means that uh, the um, uh, gap between our primal and dual solutions is not necessarily non-zero. However, in the case of multi-carrier systems, uh, it has been proven that under some uh, specific conditions, still, although the problem is not convex, this duality gap uh, reaches zero. And this has been proven to be valid for the case of the systems that they have got very large number of subcarriers, or uh, in theory, it should be infinite number of subcarriers. Was, but as in OFTM systems, we have got a, a huge number of subcarriers. This uh, uh, strong duality can still give us a really good approximation in case of uh, uh, OFTM systems in a specific. And this opens up, of course, the possibility of solving the problem, again, by using the, dual, uh, the problem in the dual domain. Although the, th this is possible, but because of the interdependency that this coupling factor, which is interference, brings between different equations, this time I mean, the uh, optimization would not be as uh, straightforward as the case that we have low interference. And this interdependency brings us significant amount of complexity because of the nested iterations that are required. And uh, some variants of iterative water filling solutions has been proposed in literature uh, for this case, although uh, the um, I mean, optimality of those solutions uh, are not proven. And those solutions are going to be uh, suboptimal solutions with a more limited amount of complexity. However, recently in literature, uh, for the notion of dense femtocells, uh, we have got a mm, uh, new achievement. In this scenario, based on the investigation that has been done, if we consider the iterative water filling solutions that has been talked about it in the previous slide, these uh, iterative water filling solutions, they provide uh, some specific properties, uh, specifically in case of dense femtocells. And uh, to see how dense condition would hold based on the investigation that uh, has been done, uh, scenarios with uh, uh, where femtocells are located with a maximum distance of at most 70 meter from each other, uh, and even up to eight femtocells can be still considered dense which is a, um, a good start for practical scenarios, for example, which is more or less in line with, for example, uh, practical models that is being used, for example, in uh, industrial systems like L LT, like 5x5 five five grid. So in this s situation, this uh, typical form, what's the characteristic of this uh, uh, form of solutions? It has been uh, shown that this type of uh, iterative water fillings gives us a, a specific form of sol uh, solutions where uh, only one base station loads power on some resources, whereas other base stations load negligible power on those resources in their scenarios. This gives us a really nice binary power allocation property, meaning that, for example, at each time, in case of dense systems, 
one base station with better channel condition is going to load that subcarrier, whereas the other base stations should back off from transmitting on that specific. Yeah. scenarios you yeah. consider an interference channel which is basically what you're considering yeah uh, so the optimal solution for uh, at least the sum rate maximization is the one in which you allow only one of the transmitters to transmit and you have to turn off all the users yeah, all, exactly. the, all the other base stations so that's this is exactly what right? yeah yeah that's a good point but that case has been proven for the case of uh, single cell scenarios when we do not consider interference no, so no, it is basically interference channel when you have multiple cells so each base station is uh, serving one one user, and that is a classical interference channel scenario. You try to maximize the sum rate. The optimal solution for that in an interference limited scenario is the one in which you you just turn on one base station, which is exactly what you are doing. So this is a classical uh, information theory. In case research. of femtosis, I think this problem has been recently identified, but. I don't know, maybe because I think this inter interference condition saying a strong interference is really dependent on the scenario. Because in case of femtocells, to identify this uh, a strong interference is quite important. As it's been uh, found recently in the literature, this case is uh, valid for, because in case of microcells, we could not, uh, I think, uh, generally say that this would be a valid case in many microcell scenarios, for example, because uh, microcells, uh, the users that are deployed in case of microcells can have different values of interference, but I think in this specific form of femtocells, which gives us the dense uh, scenario, this is more feasible. But, All right. Yeah. Thank you. So based on this, uh, it's been shown that uh, based on this scenario, allocating the power optimally based on this binary power allocation can be more rewarding than uh, different variants of uh, IWF, which is iterative water filling solutions. And uh, basically, the systems that uh, modeled based on the capacity of the systems that are modeled based on this optimal binary power allocation can give us a higher uh, capacity compared to different variants of IWF solutions that are in the, in the literature. But there is an important condition, which is the, uh, this dense condition. I mean, it's a, if you want a mathematical formulation, you can go to the references that I've got at the end of the presentation. So, but uh, this dense condition has been numerically proven can hold in many practical scenarios of femtocells, for example, specifically, for example, for the case of five by five, when they consider in the LT deployment, they have got a 50 meter by 50 meter deployment of the femtocells, and each block is 10 meter by 10 meter in this 25 uh, blocks inside the grid. So this scenario m matches well with such deployment. So considering this binary power allocation, if the power is allocated in binary fashion, of course the resource allocation problem is significantly simplified and the complexity reduces to polynomial level. And in this mode, the resource allocation is uh, more uh, simplified as we want to find the best base station to transmit per resource and at the same time, we want to select the best receiver on each resource. So. Uh, this interdependency between the problems decoupled in this scenario by considering this binary power allocation. So based on these uh, different factors that we have talked about, so important challenges that can be seen in this uh, optimization framework that I talked about. Uh, first of all, we should no note that uh, uh, decomposing a problem uh, does not have a single solution, so we can de decompose the problems in different uh, 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 cases based on different scenarios, and it depends on how and what uh, variables are used in the decomposition. And each decomposition is going to have a different practical real realization for either case of femtocells and microcells. 
And of course, for the case of uh, femtocells, as we are looking for scalability and feasibility or more distributed solutions, some notions of uh, decomposition might, be, might better fit in case of femtocells compared to the case of uh, microcells. Another issue is in case of uh, decomposition is regarding the complexity. As we talked about it, uh, um, generally these solutions are iterative, so they require passing some um, pricing messages between different entities in the network. So um, ideally we like the algorithm to converge faster and to guarantee the convergence of the algorithm. So uh, having faster convergence for the proposed algorithm is a, another important issue that needs to be considered. And uh, of course, uh, as we need to pass all these messages across the different entities in the network, the reduction in the size of pricing variables in some forms of decomposition is also an important issue. And uh, uh, as we talked about it regarding the way we choose the um, uh, initial point and also the uh, step size, uh, it uh, gives us, a, it actually, um, uh, shows our location inside the search space. So as if we have more and more limited spaces, so this would uh, uh, give us faster solutions and uh, possibility of faster convergence in the algorithms. Regarding the effic efficiency, as we talked about it, some solutions are not uh, totally optimal, so it is really important that when we come up with heuristic algorithms to see uh, how far away are we uh, from the uh, boundary of capacity region. So the closer we are to the boundary of this capacity region, the, our solutions are more efficient. And of course, in this scenario, it is important that to come up with more tunable measures to be able to just uh, uh, target any locations in this boundary of uh, the capacity region. In many scenarios, using this um, gradient or subgradient method uh, might have a stability issue because uh, uh, the optimization parameters, whether in uh, uh, primal or dual domain, they might be quite sensitive to the changes that we apply to the uh, optimization. Uh, variables by gradient method. So it's quite important that we uh, make sure the stability of the system. Yeah. Uh, one question to the previous slide. This one? Yeah. Uh, is there any difference between the uh, uh, gradient No, the, the thing was in the original problem, the factor was uh, different base stations could transmit simultaneously on different resources. So ah, that okay. power factor, the, that would brought this uncoupling um, factor. So in this manner, this problem has been decoupled, so it's easier to just update it in the resource allocation domain. And so yeah, so these three different issues are quite important regarding the efficiency of the system, especially in different uh, femtocell scenarios. So basically, that was my talk about uh, this. As the concluding remark, we talked about this cross-layer optimization, about the necessity and definition, and the general trends that we have got there. And then we have focused on a specific form of cross-layer operations that we termed as air interface-centric scheduling. And we uh, try to understand it better by customer provider model. We try to see what's the position of femtocells in this model. And we try to see scheduling as the optimization problem. We've talked about different methods of representation. Uh, we've talked about the fairness issue, utility optimization. And we have also talked about different ways of opti optimization based on uh, heuristic uh, solutions or based on uh, near optimal solutions. And we have also talked about some challenges that might come up in using such uh, uh, optimization tools and optimization scenarios. So thank you very much for listening to this presentation. And this is the list of references if you want to have a look at them in more details. And that's it. Thank you very much. OK, thank you, Mahadad. If uh, Any questions, please?
good <laughs> okay so in case if there are no questions let's thank again mehdad for a nice presentation okay and uh, this is the end of uh, today's session and tomorrow the uh, we'll start on self organization with misha's talk and as he told we'll end on misha's talk as well and i'll be sandwich in between so tomorrow is the revenge day for you okay so thank you very much okay then see you bye